In our day and age, it has become accepted by mainstream Christianity and mainstream churches that Christians cannot, or rather should not, experience any suffering. Suffering of any kind is seen by many Christians today as a result of a lack of faith or because of some sin that has been committed. It is safe to say that many Christians have a wrong and unbiblical worldview regarding suffering. And because of this, when faced with suffering, they are unprepared and do not know how to biblically react to it. The danger of having an unbiblical worldview regarding suffering is that Christians tend to equate their spiritual state with their physical condition. Some think that just because it's going well with them physically, that it must mean that spiritually it's also going well. Again, on the other side of the spectrum, some think that because it's going unwell or badly with them physically, that means it, they interpret it as it's going spiritually bad with them. This is unbiblical. Sometimes suffering is the will of God. I know that is a controversial statement in our day and age, that sometimes suffering is the will of God. For most of church history, Christians understood this. Christians knew this and they embraced this fact that sometimes suffering is the will of God. We see an example of this from the life of the Apostle Paul. In fact, remember what Jesus said about the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 verse 16? Jesus said, For I will show him, Paul, how much he must suffer for my name's sake. An Old Testament example that we are all familiar with is Job. God allowed Job to suffer. We see how the early church suffered as Christians lost their property, their social status, and very often, yes, even their lives. Christians today in many places of the world suffer. In Syria, in Iraq, and Pakistan, India, China, and many other places, Christians suffer because of their faith. Martin Luther said about suffering, he says, A faith that does not give anything, a faith that costs nothing, a faith that suffers nothing, is worth nothing. The question is not, are Christians supposed to suffer? Rather, the right question is, how do we remain faithful in the midst of suffering. How do we remain faithful in the midst of suffering? Now you see, suffering is a theme that runs throughout the first epistle of Peter. 1 Peter. The word suffering appears 14 times in this short epistle, in these five chapters. Along with other words, such as trials, testings and fiery ordeals and many more words. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter writes about suffering for Christ and he encourages the believers who are experiencing this suffering, he encourages them to whom he, he is writing to endure hardships and suffering. The recipients of the, let, of the letter of 1 Peter were experiencing sufferings and hardships of many different kinds. As already mentioned, some of them experienced social and financial hardships because of their faith in Jesus. Others were, ex- were physically threatened. Others were tortured and beaten. And a lot of them lost their lives for, for the sake of Christ. These original readers from the book of 1 Peter were experiencing severe difficulties for their hope and their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. In the passage that we are going to look at this morning, 
1 Peter chapter 5 verse 6 to 11, we are going to get instructions on how to remain faithful in difficult times. It is clear from our passage, 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 6 to 11, it is clear from our passage and the rest of the Bible, and listen, that our obedience should not depend on our situation. Our obedience should not depend on our situation. And our situation is not a reflection of our spiritual well-being. If the early Christians had believed that their physical well-being was a reflection of their spiritual well-being, all of them must have failed because most of them died after having lived lives of severe hardships and suffering. Now as we study our passage, it is important to note that our section of study, 1 Peter 5 verse 6 to 11, can be considered Peter's summary. It is the summary of all his teachings from the book of 1 Peter. These are his final words. These are his final exhortations and encouragements. In 1 Peter 5 verse 6 to 11, you are going to see three commandments you must obey in order to remain faithful in difficult times. Three commandments you must obey in order to remain faithful in difficult times. And so please read along with me. 1 Peter 5, starting at verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself Restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's just quickly have a word of prayer. Lord, we pray that You would be glorified this morning for the preaching of Your Word. Lord, may You be exalted. Lord, may we see Christ. Lord, show us Christ. Build us up. Make us more like our Lord. Help us to become great glorifiers of our glorious God. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The first commandment that you must obey in order to remain faithful in difficult times is be humble. Verse 6. Be humble. We find this command in the beginning of this paragraph where the apostle writes... Humble yourselves. Whenever we see a therefore in, a, in our text, a passage of scripture, our verse 6 starts with humble yourselves therefore. Whenever you see a therefore in the passage, ask yourself, what is the therefore therefore? Whenever that, that is what we must do. In this case, it is pointing us back to the previous paragraph. Our, our section is linking us back specifically to the last sentence of the previous paragraph. Chapter 5, verse 5. Peter writes, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to your elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with all humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves. The Apostle Peter ends his epistle by reminding his readers about the reality of God's grace and how they must never remove themselves from God's grace. They must never remove themselves from this mindset of pursuing humility because if they do, if they become proud, they place themselves in opposition to God. In the verse we just read, chapter 5, verse 5, Peter uses the words, all of you. All of you. 
he is speaking to more than just the young men that he mentioned in the beginning of the verse. He is speaking to the elders of the church that he mentioned in chapter 5 verse 1. He is speaking to more than just, he is also speaking to the husbands and the wives that he mentioned in chapter 3. Peter is including everyone in this reminder to be humble and therefore not be opposed by God. It is from this general exhortation that he moves to a clear-cut command in chapter 5 verse 6. Humble yourselves. Or stated differently, be humble. Why is it important that we as believers humble ourselves? Well, Peter already gave us the answer to that because God opposes the proud. If you are not pursuing humility, you are proud. There's no middle ground. Charles Spurgeon said the following about humility. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. If you struggle with humility, and I know you do because all of us do. It is a besetting sin in all of our hearts. If you struggle, it means primarily that you have forgotten who God is. Or to put it another way, the key to humility is to know who God truly is and therefore know who you truly are. Who are we? Well, the Bible calls us sinners. By nature, we are called children of wrath. We are called enemies of God. We are called rebellious creatures. This is who we are by nature. What does the Bible say? Who is God? Well, God is holy, holy, holy. God is good. God is love. God is light. God is compassion. Compared to God, we are almost the embodiment of evil. If you struggle to be humble, commit yourself to knowing God. Commit yourself to knowing God. All of this is important because our humility is rooted in who God is. Our text makes this clear. Peter writes, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. If we were to truly be aware of how mighty our God is, we would never be tempted To be proud again. This phrase, the mighty hand of God, that phrase is actually a very crucial, important phrase. Peter is here directly drawing from the Old Testament. More specifically, Peter is making an explicit reference to the book of Exodus. He is reminding his readers how God dealt with arrogant Pharaoh. How God rescued His people from their suffering in Egypt. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 19, it is written, God is speaking, But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go, unless compelled by a mighty hand. Again a few chapters later, Exodus 6 verse 1, But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a mighty hand He will send them out. And with a strong hand, He will drive them out of His land. Uh, Another few chapters on, Exodus 13 verse 3. It is written, Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery. For by a mighty hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. A few verses down, chapter 13 verse 19. For for with a mighty hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. And chapter 13, verse verse 14. And when when in time to come, your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. And the last verse, Exodus 13, verse 16. 
It shall be as a mark on your hand and frontlets between your eyes. For by a mighty hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. It is with this in mind that Peter writes to his readers and says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God. By making such an explicit Old Testament reference, Peter is reminding his audience that God is able to protect them and able to provide for them in the midst of their suffering. Just like the suffering the Israelites had to go through, it had not gone unnoticed by God. So will the suffering of these Christians to whom Peter is writing, their suffering will not go unnoticed by God. Christians are to be humble in the midst of their suffering, not feel sorry for themselves, You know, self-pity is just another form of pride. Christians are not to blame God. Christians are not to hate their enemies, but to humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, knowing, just like with the Israelites, that God will protect and deliver. Their suffering, the recipients of this letter's suffering, is not a sign of God's abandonment, or displeasure, but instead we learn from the Exodus narrative that their suffering is being used by God for their good and His glory. This is why Paul could write Romans 8.28 and we know that for those who love God all things work together for good. All things without exception. Peter then supplements his first command, be humble, by giving them a reason. He gives us a reason. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you. This exalting is not to be taken out of context, like so many of the prosperity teachers do today. This exalting of God towards believers is meant to be understood in the last days. This has end times significance. We know this because throughout the epistle of First Peter, Peter uses similar terms and the same words to refer to the last days. We see that in chapter 1 verse 5, chapter 1 verse 7, chapter 1 verse 13, also chapter 2 verse 12, and lastly chapter 4 verse 7. Those who are humble, those who trust God for who He is and the promises that He has made will be exalted on the last day. Will be exalted on the last day. This is equivalent to Paul's words in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, where Paul wrote, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who loved His appearing. Believers are to be humbled and entrust themselves and their circumstances to God. Because one day, in the future, we will be vindicated. We will be rewarded. As the text says, we will be exalted. This closely resembles Jesus' words in Revelation chapter 2 verse 10, where Jesus speaks to the church. He says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. I will give you the crown of life. Our suffering will never go unnoticed by God. Even if you are not suffering right now, it's not an issue or a question of if, it's a question of when. Are you prepared? Do you have the correct mindset to deal with suffering when it comes? Even if you're not suffering right now, your obedience will not go unnoticed by God. Peter then gives us a way 
how we can humble ourselves. We, we've seen how the command, we must humble ourselves. We've seen why we must humble ourselves, that He may exalt us. But now a, a good question to ask is, well, how do we humble ourselves? How does it look? Peter actually gives us an example from the text. Verse 6, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, Casting all your anxieties on Him. Because He cares for you. We can translate that last sentence as, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God by casting all your anxieties on Him. Some translations have translated it that way, which is correct. The greatest show of faith and trust in God is by trusting God to take care of us. I'm sure all of you can testify. It's easy to trust God when things are going well. It's easy to trust God when you have some savings in the bank account. It's easy to trust God when at this moment things are going well. But these verses are truly applicable to us when we go into difficult circumstances. Circumstances. When we are anxious, it is a form of unbelief. Anxiety is evidence of us in the moment not trusting God. We are not trusting that God will work all things together for our good. Holding on to our anxieties and things that make us anxious is in essence us trying to be God, not trusting God. We show our humility in recognizing our limitations and our dependence on who God is. And when we cast our anxieties on Him, we show our faith. We show our humility. To cast your anxieties on God is to bring your burdens, your struggles and your worries prayerfully and faithfully to God. To trust that He will provide an outcome that firstly glorifies Him and that works for your good. If you struggle with anxiety or you struggle to trust God, again, I want to remind you, I want to repeat, it is most probably that you have forgotten who God is. Peter writes, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. If you do not know that God has a mighty hand, why on earth would you go to Him? Peter gives us the reason why we must cast our anxieties on Him. Because He cares for you. He cares for you. Just an interesting observation. The, the root, the etymology of that word care is where we get our word porcelain from. from. It's, God sees us as being delicate, sees us as being breakable, and because of that, He cares for us, just like you would care for a very delicate vase. When we hold on to our anxieties, there's no other way to say it. It is a sign of unbelief. Remember what Jesus said about the worries of tomorrow? Oh, you of little faith. Do you not know that your Father who is in heaven will provide for you? It is a sign of our unbelief. Either our unbelief in God's power, His mighty hand, or our unbelief can be rooted in the fact that we doubt His care for us. Knowing who God is and then trusting God is absolutely crucial If you want to remain faithful in the midst of suffering. If you want to endure suffering, you must know who God is and you must believe that He cares for you. You can only endure suffering by being humble. Why? Because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He gives grace by exalting the suffering Christian and by caring for the suffering Christian. God is good. Charles Spurgeon said the following, 
He said, I have learned to love the waves that smash me against the rock of ages. I have learned to love the waves that smash me against the rock of ages. How we react to our suffering and how we remain faithful is directly related to how we view God and how we handle our suffering in relation to God. And so let us humble ourselves by trusting in Him, not in ourselves. This is the first way we can be faithful to God in difficult times. At the same time, how we remain faithful in suffering is also related to how we respond to our adversary, the devil. In verse 8, Peter gives us two commandments that we must obey if we want to remain faithful in difficult times. Verse 8, 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. The second command you must obey if you want to remain faithful in difficult times, be sober-minded. Be sober-minded. The word used here for sober-minded means to not be influenced by something like a substance like alcohol. It means to be free from illusion, to be free from an intoxication of sin. It refers to being in your right mind. It means having a presence of mind. Basically, in summary, to be sober-minded means the opposite of irrationality. The opposite of being influenced by outside worldly factors. This command builds on top of the first commandment. You cannot be sober minded if you are proud and arrogant. You must have a right and a biblical view of God and of yourself in order to be sober minded. You must be humble to be sober minded. This command means that you must have a realistic perception of yourself. Do not put yourself in situations where you know you will be tempted to sin. This means to have a biblical worldview. To be sober-minded practically means to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit and not under the influence of anything or anyone else. How can you be more and more under the influence of the Holy Spirit? How can you be sober-minded, be realistic? Well, by knowing the Word of God. It's elementary, but we cannot move past it. Paul writes in Colossians 3 verse 16, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. When Christians suffer, they tend to be guided by their emotions. I'm sure this cannot just be true of me. When Christians suffer, we tend to go into self-pity. Many people, when they go through difficulty, they turn to influencing substances like drugs and alcohol. As Christians, our suffering must make us all the more sober-minded. Suffering is a gift from God that helps us to let go of this world and depend on Him. Worldliness, worldliness, clinging onto this world is a sin that our our hearts love. And suffering is God's way of prying our hands loose Of these things that we hold on that will sink us down into hell. That is why James could write, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds. Various kinds. Why are we to be sober minded? Because we have an adversary, the devil. Peter writes 
that the devil is prowling around like a roaring lion, not just looking, it's interesting, it's not the word looking for someone to devour, it's seeking, it's the word desiring, it's his earnest desire to devour. He is, he's prowling around desiring, seeking someone to devour. The devil is the father of lies, he's a murderer. The devil wants to destroy Christians. See, a, a big misconception that many people have today about the devil is that they think the devil wants you to focus on him. That's not true. The devil doesn't need you to worship him. He just needs to distract you from worshiping God. Be sober-minded. Know this and be aware of the tactics that he uses. The devil devours by making us justify the smallest sins in our lives. By making us allow pet sins into our lives. The devil devours by taking advantage of our unguarded thoughts. The devil devours by bringing bitterness in our hearts towards people. The devil devours by, by letting, convincing us to allow lust for people or things in our hearts. The devil devours by having us fill our time, not necessarily with things that are sinful, but just by things that are not useful. My friends, do not think that you can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. He has lived much longer than you. He is wiser than you. Be sober-minded. Be realistic. Have nothing, have nothing to do that influences you to justify your sin. Because all of that is the devil prowling around. Pursue what is godly. Pursue what is good. Pursue what is right and biblical. In the words of Paul, whatever you do, make it your aim to please God. This is the only command. <clears throat> this is the only command that Peter gives. This is not the only command that Peter gives us regarding our adversary. He gives us another command. We are to be sober-minded and watchful. Again, I read for us 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This third commandment that you must obey in order to remain faithful to God is be watchful. To be watchful means to be vigilant. It means to be awake. It means to be aware. It means to be responsible and careful. Jesus used this exact same word in Matthew 24 verse 23 when he spoke about his second coming. Be alert, be awake, be watchful. Well, we are watchful primarily by examining ourselves. We examine our lives to see if there are habits or practices that we must pay attention to. We must examine ourselves for any possible sin. My dear friends, many Christians today are afraid of this concept of self-examination. They are afraid to examine themselves. I know I am as well, because what are we afraid of? We are afraid of finding things that we do not like. We are afraid of doubt. Once you start to examine yourself, it might lead to doubt. But do I really know Christ? It's, it's not nice. But I want to remind you. Doubt is not your enemy. You know what is the enemy? A false assurance. A false assurance. I would much rather have you examine yourself daily, daily going to Christ, than thinking you are okay, and then one day hear the words, I never knew you. We must be watchful. If you examine yourselves, if you examine yourself and there's things you see you don't like, if there are things you see that start making you doubt your own salvation, what must you do? Well, what must you do to be saved? Go to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus stands ready and willing 
He stands eager to grab anyone who calls out to him. We often think of our God as being a vindictive God. We often think of God as, is he, am I doing it right? Am I, am I believing correctly? Do I have correct faith? We are afraid of one day seeing God and hearing, ha, ah, you thought you believed, but you didn't actually believe. That is not who our God is. That is not who Christ is. He stands ready to call upon, to grab anyone who calls upon Him. Anyone. That is why Jesus calls us to rest in Him. He is the Good Shepherd. Look to Christ. Trust in Christ. Trust in Him. My friends, you do not need an education to trust. You do not need degrees to trust. You do not need a high IQ to trust or a perfect church attendance to trust. Even a child can trust. Trust in Christ. He promised that all who call upon His name will be saved. This concept of, that Peter uses here of being watchful in our suffering, it also has end times implications. Part of our hope is our unification with Jesus. Even if we suffer, we know that we will go to be with the Lord at any moment. Even if you are not yet united in Christ now, we must be watchful and remember that this suffering is but a mere momentary affliction. My friends, I know in the midst of suffering, while you are in the heat of going through trials and tribulations and suffering, I know in that midst of suffering, it feels like time is standing still. It feels like this will be what it will be like for the rest of your life. But that is when we must not be guided by our emotions, but we must be guided by the truth. These are but momentary light afflictions in the light of eternal glory. That is what we have to wait. That is what we have to look forward to. In summary, we have to remember that we have an adversary and that his desire is to rob us of our joy and our souls. Because of this, we must be sober minded and watchful. Because of this, if we are not, if we are not humble, we will fall into the condemnation of the devil. But Peter also tells us, if we continue in the paragraph, that we must resist the devil. We do not resist the devil, as so many do today, by binding him or cursing him. The text actually tells us how to resist the devil. Well, firstly, we resist the devil by being obedient to these three commandments. Be humble, be sober-minded, be watchful. This ultimately helps us to resist the devil in our faith. And to resist the devil by knowing we are not alone. And to resist the devil because of our hope in the future. Read along with me 1 Peter 5 verse 9. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. To resist the devil by being firm in your faith means to firmly trust in Christ. Trust in Christ. You need to trust in Christ, who He said He is, and what He has come to accomplish on our behalf. Jesus Christ, God who became man, who lived a perfect, sinless life in our place, and died a gruesome, bloody death on our behalf, taking the wrath of God on Himself for our sins. This Jesus Christ was raised from the dead as evidence that God has accepted His sacrifice. So in Jesus we can be made righteous. In Jesus we are made right. We are reconciled with God. 
Jesus now reigns. He now intercedes for us. Isn't it comforting to know, as the Hebrew writers teaches us, that Jesus is at this moment praying for you? We resist the devil in our faith by always trusting Christ. I want to remind you again. When are you tempted to sin the most? When you stop worshipping. Worship's not just the songs we sing, it's part of it. But worship is what we do, what we think, what we say. Worship is directed towards God, giving glory towards God in whatever we do. You start to sin. You are tempted to sin the moment you stop worshipping. Practically, if you want to stop sinning, never stop worshipping. When you stop to worship and you sin, what must you do? Repent. Turn to Christ. Repentance. Many Christians look at repentance today as a negative thing. Oh, I've sinned. I must repent now. My friends, repentance is a gift from God. It is a great gift of God. The day you stopped repenting is the day God's grace has been removed from you. Repentance is a gift from God. Praise God when you repent. Thank God that He's coming to save the one sheep and He left the 99 others. We resist the devil by being mindful of the fact that we are not alone. Many Christians have and are experiencing similar or worse sufferings and difficulties than you might be facing. We can be strengthened and encouraged by these Christians and their examples. But most importantly, we can be encouraged to see how God has been faithfully keeping others who have suffered. God never forgets His suffering children. Lastly, we resist the devil by knowing that one day we will receive eternal glory in Christ. Our sufferings are temporary, but our glory in Christ will be eternal. Why on earth would you trade an eternal inheritance for temporary comfort? No investment officer will tell you that's a good idea. Did Jesus not endure even the cross for the joy that was set before Him? Why then should we fear temporary suffering, momentary difficulty, when eternal joy lays just on the other side of this hill? Do not let the devil distract you from this. Resist it. Remember the eternal glory. Do you believe that? Sincere question of self-examination. Do you believe in the eternal joy that is laying in wait for you? Peter ends this section in verse 11. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. All of the above commandments and motivations can be summed up in one word, as already mentioned. Worship. Peter ends by worshipping God. This is what it's all about. This is why the original readers were suffering in the first place. This is why they have an adversary. All because they have been called and stayed committed to worshipping God. These recipients understood that Jesus Christ is worth more than anything this world can give you. And losing anything in this world is nothing compared to losing the source of love, the source of joy, the source of light, the source of peace, the source of holiness Himself, Jesus Christ our Lord. Will you also have the same mindset and faith? We worship God through our faithfulness. And we remain faithful in difficult times by being humble, by being sober-minded, and by being watchful. May God help us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we praise You for this amazing passage, this amazing text of Scripture. Lord, help us to remain faithful in difficult times, Lord.
Lord, if you do not build the house, we will not stand. Lord, if you do not keep us, we will fall away. So, Lord, we pray for your grace. We pray, Lord, help us. Help us to be humble so that we may receive your grace. Not to be opposed by you in difficulties. Lord, help us to be watchful. Help us to be sober-minded. Lord, help us to trust simply as a child would trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.